Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 7. If you're using the Pew Bible, the text is found on page 1564. 1,564, Mark 7, beginning with verse 24. And you want to leave your Bibles open because we're going to go kind of verse by verse through the Scriptures to see what God is really seeking to say to us from the text. You'll remember last Sunday, if you were here, we looked at the text just preceding the text today. And we discovered how Jesus had been confronting the Pharisees and the scribes over the washing of hands before the meal because they were very upset with his disciples who did not go through the ceremonial cleansing before they sat down to eat. And the, Jesus told them it wasn't what went in a man that defiled him, it's what came out. And we talked about being uh, pure on the inside because that's what really needs to show on the outside, the, the purity, the love, the grace that God has placed within us. Now at that time, just prior to his confrontation with the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus had been doing a great deal of healing because everywhere that Jesus went, People brought their sick to him so that he might touch them and, and make them whole. And after the experience of so many healings in uh, Gennesaret, and then the confrontation with the Pharisees and the scribes, again in Gennesaret, Jesus was tired. He, he needed some time to, to be away from the crowds. And so he decides he's going to take his disciples and he's going to head north. Now he's heading out of Israel and into the Gentile area. He's going up to Tyre. Tyre is quite a bit north, north of Gennesareth, over on the coast. And it is the place where the Phoenicians and the Syrians lived. It's really a Syrian territory, what we would call Syria today. And Jesus goes there with his disciples. Surely nobody there is going to come around him and not give him the space that he needs right now just to, to be alone, maybe with the Father, or to sit down with his disciples and have quality time just to teach them some of the things that they need to know. So this is where the text takes place. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house, did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. It seems as though everywhere that Jesus went, there was always a crowd. Now he thought up north, out of Israel, up in Syria, surely, surely the folks are not going to crowd around him. But his, his uh, reputation had preceded him even to the north in the land of the Gentiles. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact... As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demons out of her daughter. This woman was not one of the children of God as far as being a descendant of Abraham. Uh, this woman as a Phoenician, and over actually in Matthew's Gospel, as he shares the same story, speaks of her as being a Canaanite. Uh, she would have worshipped a different God, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She would have um, put all of her faith and her hope in, in her spiritual heritage, such as it was. Uh, to think of Jesus as a son of God, as a Messiah, as, as someone who could make things different, I'm not so sure she came with that understanding. But she did come with the understanding that this man had a reputation of healing people. So she comes and she begs. She doesn't ask. She just begs Jesus to get involved and to drive the demon out of, out of her daughter. I want you to look at Jesus' answer. He said, first... Let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. How would you have felt if you heard those words of Jesus? Now I want you to understand, because we don't get it in the English. You get it in the Greek. There are different words for dogs. 
the Jews often thought of those non-Jews as being dogs. And the words they used was uh, a word that kind of like a mangy mud. But the word that Jesus is using is like a household pet. There's a difference between a mangy mud and a household pet. And so he, it's, it's a much softer word. But to let her understand that the gospel was meant first for the Jews. But that's not to block out the, the Gentiles. But it was first for the Jews. Let the, little, let the children eat all they want. It's not right to take what belongs to them to the, from the children and, and toss it to the pets. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. How would you have responded? Would you have responded with something like this lady did? Or would you have just turned your back and walked away in anger because of what Jesus had said? You see, this woman was so concerned about her daughter's welfare, she was not to turn away. She was going to follow this through as long as it would take for Jesus to hear her out. I had dogs throughout most of my life, and the last few dogs have been inside pets. And, you know, the dog would come and sit under the table while we ate hoping we'd drop some crumbs so that uh, he could lick them up. And if you were uh, noticing maybe children at the table that didn't want everything on their plate, they might sneak it off and even put it under the table for the dogs to, to eat. That way you can say, see, my plate's clean. Even the dogs are allowed, the little pets are allowed to eat the crumbs that fall. It might be first for the children of Israel, but how about the rest of us? You see, Jesus came not just for the children of Israel. He came for the whole world. And this was almost a test of this woman's faith. Do you really believe I can do something about your daughter? She did not turn away. She answered him. And he told her, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Jesus didn't have to say, demon be gone. He simply knew that because of this woman's faith, he could work that miracle miles away. The demon is gone. She went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon, indeed, was gone. Now, the second miracle is similar to the first in many ways. We'll look at it and then combine them together. When Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre, he went to Sidon, through Sidon, down to the sea. Now, he's going from Tyre up 20 miles to Sidon, come all the way down to the Jordan beneath the, the, Galil uh, the Sea of Galilee. He's going to cross the Jordan and come back to where the sea is. That's the region of the Decapolis. That's ten Greek cities that are together. Again, Gentile territory. And there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. Just as the woman had brought, not her daughter, for she couldn't bring her, but brought a request for the daughter, here are people, friends of a man who is uh, not able to hear and could barely speak with a speech impediment. And they come bringing him to Jesus. And they come begging him, just like the woman before, not just asking, begging Jesus to place his hand upon that man who's deaf. After Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. His fingers into the man's ears. The man is deaf. He cannot hear. But this may be a type of sign language for him too. I'm going to do something about your ears. And he puts his fingers into his ears. Then, the scripture says, He spit and touched the man's tongue. 
You see, there was thought to be healing in human spittle. That was a, something that the folks of that day and time really believed. Jesus was taking almost part of his life, his spirit, and putting it upon the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And at this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He had done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Now look at the two stories. First of all, we see that the people involved for the healing were not able to come on their own. It took someone who loved them and cared about them to bring them to Jesus. And they loved them and cared about them enough that they, they didn't just ask Jesus. They begged Jesus to do something, to bring healing, to bring relief. And in both cases, Jesus does. But I want you to look at the, at the determination of the people who brought the request to Jesus. They were determined not to leave until Jesus answered their prayer. Until the Lord either touched or somehow made their loved ones whole. The second thing I, I want you to notice is that when these people, be it the daughter of the Phoenician woman or be it the man who is deaf and with a speech impediment, these people had to experience something that day that they needed. We don't see it so much with the demon leaving the child, but we do see it with the man who was deaf and practically mute. We see it in him because he had to accept the touch of Jesus. He had to open his mouth that his tongue might be touched by the Lord. He had to want what Jesus was willing to give bad enough that he was going to be obedient to what Jesus asked as it made him whole once again. The third thing I want you to notice is that when this man's mouth was opened and his ears were opened, the first thing he did was to speak plainly. And I, the Bible doesn't really tell us what he said, but I suspect he did a lot of praising. Wouldn't you? A lot of praising because of what God has just done for him through Jesus. The man may not have understood how, but he understood what happened. Miracles that happened because Jesus was there, because people cared, and because of obedience and acceptance of those who were being healed. Now, what does all these, these stories have to, or these two stories have to say to New Bethel Baptist this morning? Because we really need to bring it home. I don't know all the people who live in this community, and no doubt you don't either. But you know the people who live in your neighborhood. You know whether or not they have needs. Are they out mowing the lawn on Sunday morning when you're on your way to church? Now, some of the folks I see are out mowing on Sunday morning when I'm on my way to church. Do you see their needs? Do you understand them and know them well enough that if there is a need in their lives, there is a hurt. They are not churched people. They are not people who are really spiritual in their relationship with Jesus. Do you care about them enough that you will plead with them to come with you to church? Will you plead with them enough and bring them here to this place of worship and praise? 
Because you see, my brothers and sisters, the only way that we're going to accomplish what our Lord has asked us to accomplish is to go out into the communities where we live and invite people to come and bring them here. And we will only do that if we care about them enough. These people in the stories cared about these folks enough that they brought their request and the need to Jesus. Do you care about your neighbors enough that you'll bring them? to Jesus. The second thing is, this woman, for example, just kept pleading. It didn't, she didn't take no for an answer. She didn't get her feelings hurt and turn away. She kept pleading for Jesus to be involved. In prayer, do we plead for the Holy Spirit to touch the lives of our loved ones and our neighbors. Do we plead for their salvation? Are we concerned enough that we will continue to pray day after day for their spiritual needs? Are we concerned enough that we will beg Jesus to intervene in their lives through the Holy Spirit? There's another thing. Are we obedient? that we will allow Jesus to do in us what He desires to do. Are we obedient when He wants to touch our ears and open them to an understanding of the Word? Are we obedient that we will open our mouths and let Him touch our tongues and, and place within us the words that we need to say to the community around us, the words we need to say of love and grace to one another? Are we obedient to let the Lord loose our tongue so that we may not have a spiritual speech impediment, but rather that we might be able to speak about the love of God and what Jesus is doing in our lives? You see, Jesus had already said, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men, all people, unto myself. And he went to Tyre, and he went to Sidon, and he went to the Decapolis. They weren't necessarily Jewish places of residence. They weren't. They were Greek places of residence. You may have some Jews out in the Decapolis, but not up inside an entire. He wanted us to know in the Scripture that His love is for everyone. His grace is for everyone. But that there are a lot of people around us who will never know it unless you tell them. Unless you tell them. Folks, the, the secret to growth at New Bethel Baptist Church is willingness on our part to reach out to the neighbors and the neighborhoods. You may have heard it said before, pastors don't reproduce sheep. Sheep reproduce sheep. Pastors give guidance and leadership. But pastors never gave birth to a sheep. Sheep do that. And you're the sheep the sheep of God's fold in this place. For a new birth to take place in here, a new beginning to take place in here, it first has to start in here, in our hearts, where God will place a compassion in us for the lost, a passion to reach out and touch and bring them in. My challenge to you, each of you, is take seriously your responsibility as a sheep of the fold and go out and reproduce sheep and bring them into this fold that we can grow and become strong enough to do all that God intends for us to do in this place. It will happen if you're faithful. It will happen if you're concerned enough to bring them in. The Phoenician mother was concerned enough. She couldn't bring her daughter in, but she could come to Jesus with her request. 
The people were concerned enough about the deaf man with a speech impediment that they brought him in. And the deaf man was open to what Jesus wanted to do. Jesus wants to open our ears spiritually. And he wants to open our mouths spiritually. And he wants us to speak his praise. And share in his word. And his message. And glorify him. Let your light so shine, Jesus said, before others. That they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You see, God has kind of put the ball in our court for growth. What will you do with it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of miracles. We, we sang earlier, tell me the stories of Jesus, and these are just two stories. But, oh, Lord, how they can speak to us. They tell us of your love and your compassion. They, they tell us of your grace and your willingness to, to heal. They tell us of, of how you can make those, those with, with special needs in their lives uh, made whole again. They tell us of your love. And they tell us of your outreach to us. Oh, God, help us to learn from the Word what it is we are called to do as your people, as the sheep of your pasture, in this place we call New Bethel, the new house of God. Father, I don't know the hearts of everyone gathered here this morning. I've had a few months to get to, to know them, and uh, Lord, they're good people. But there may just be some in this crowd today that's never turned them, their hearts over to you, never ask you to come into their lives to be Savior and Lord. And today, Father, if, if there's anyone present, I pray that who needs to make that decision, I pray that they might come forward to re repent publicly of sin and to receive you, O oh Jesus, as Savior and Lord. And then, Father, I would pray for those who are not members of this church but who worship here. If this is where you would have them have their membership, that they can be actively involved in the ongoing ministry of this church. And I pray that today they might come. Or others who may want to recommit their hearts and their lives to you, that they might come and do so publicly. Or others, Lord, who, who just want to come and pray at, at the altar for special needs in their lives. This is your call to us and our opportunity to respond to your call in our own personal way. And so, Lord, what we do here may be pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.